Hey everybody and welcome to Round Glass Review. In today's video we're going to talk about the Nikon Reflex Nikkor and Reflex Nikkor C 500mm f8. Now the difference between these two lenses is solely in the coatings. So the Reflex Nikkor was made from 1968 to 1974 and then the C was made from 74 to 83. The C version is multi-coated the reflex Nikkor without the C is single coated. Typical uses for this lens include sports, wildlife, airplane and train photography and other subjects where space between the user and the subject is either required or preferred. Also, if you're new to this series, there won't be any test charts or situations that intentionally set this lens up to succeed or fail. These reviews are based on real world use and aim to provide images and video that mimics how you are likely to actually use this lens. My contribution, which gives nothing whatsoever that you can't find on Camerapedia, is that the focal length and angle of view are 500 millimeters and 5 degrees. Now that's on full frame. If you do want to use this on APS-C, for which there are many good reasons, that bumps it to 750 millimeters and around 3.4 degrees for your angle of view. The aperture range is fixed at f8 because of the way that mirror lenses are built. There is no way to put a, an adjustable aperture into them. The filter size is 39 millimeters, and that's because this lens uses rear mount filters. There is a front filter on the thread that is 82 millimeters, but it's a 0.75 millimeter pitch, and standard 82 millimeters will not fit on it. The closest focus on this lens is a hair less than 4 meters, which is approximately 10 feet. It is manual focus only. It was available only in Nikon F. It weighs 705 grams, which is largely the metal housing, as this only has five elements. Three of them are small and two of them are mirrors. The Reflex Nikkor 500mm is a catadioptric lens. It's a small telescope. The lens uses two surface coated mirrors and three optical refractive elements within the lens housing and those focus the light and darn do they do a good job by the standards of 1960s mirror lenses. Now note that the ray trace that I put in here looks different from normal because the central part of the lens is blocked by a mirror so it's a slightly different presentation of the way that the light moves through the lens. The earliest versions of this lens will have single-coated optics. In 1970, Nikon started to roll out multi-coating, which they termed Nikon Integrated Coatings, or NIC. The hyphen C at the end of the Reflex Nikkor C is included to indicate that that version of this lens is multi-coated, although it uses the exact same optical design as the older Reflex Nikkor lenses, such as the one used for the sample images and video in this review. Sharpness is very good by 1960s mirror lens standards, but that's also kind of like getting to be the spaceman in a kitty game of backyard spaceman and aliens. Yes, you got to be the spaceman, but no one cares. So to say that this is sharp by 1960s mirror lens standards is not high praise because this lens is only slightly sharper than what most optical nerds would consider minimally acceptable for lens resolution at all. But to have the resolution that this lens delivers from a mirror lens is great, especially given the age and relative cost of these lenses today. So Nikon's engineers deserve a lot of credit here because most mirror lenses are honestly not worth the money that people pay for them. And this one, it is. And while this lens does struggle today by today's standards, especially on ultra high resolution digital sensors. It was great by the standards of its time, and it can still take good photos now, and a very basic workflow, which you could set up with macros in Photoshop, will take care of a lot of the flaws that this lens has. And flaws, by the way, huge air quotes on that, because you can introduce sharpening and contrast, which will really fundamentally change this lens's image characteristic and make the images from it substantially better. Build quality on this lens is also good in keeping with the standards of high-end Nikon lenses of the time, but it's not perfect. There are some issues 
the lens mount, at least on mine, is a little loose, though that could also be because it was a very heavily used lens by the professional photographer who owned it before me. And for decades, he used this lens a lot for about 30 years. Aberrations on this lens are controlled very well. This lens has effectively zero coma chromatic aberration and spherical aberration, and now that's because it's a mirror lens. Many of the lens aberrations that exist within lens systems exist because refractive systems pass light through glass. And while this does have refractive elements, they exist to do some focusing and correction of the, the issues that exist from mirror systems. But because the mirrors in this lens are surface coated, the light doesn't pass through those large mirrored uh, surfaces. And so there is less opportunity within this system for some of those coma and uh, chromatic and spherical aberration issues to be introduced into the images. Out of focus characteristics are hideous, but not always. So interestingly with this lens, the out-of-focus area quality depends on the nature of the background, the subject-to-lens distance, and the subject-to-background distance. So aligning those three things imperfectly, and there is a big margin for error, by the way, in the way that you align these things. But if you align them imperfectly, the out-of-focus area takes on a jumbled, chaotic quality that I call donut bedlam. Coincidentally, uh, donut bedlam, that's also what I call Saturday morning after a night of heavy drinking. Now on the other side of that equation, when you do balance those three factors well, the focus area becomes fine to pleasing, and that's different than is the case with very, very many mirror lenses. Now what's happening with that and why it exists in that way is because the catadioptric lens itself creates donut-shaped circles of confusion. With lenses, the circles of confusion, which is the blurry points of light, those take on the shape of the aperture. This is why you can get ninja star look things with uh, out of focus point source lights, for instance, in images with some with lenses of certain uh, certain aperture shapes. But in catadioptric lenses, the aperture is a fixed toroid. Circles of confusion overlap, and that's true of any lens. And that's what gives your lens its out-of-focus area characteristic. Whether that lens delivers an out-of-focus area characteristic that is pleasing, smooth, jittery, chaotic, or fork in the eye. So the specific mechanism in this lens that affects out-of-focus area characteristics is the combination of the circle of confusion size. Larger circles means more overlap, and that means a less jittery out-of-focus area. And that that circle of confusion size stems from the way that the lens is focused. So if you have a whole bunch of very, very small circles of confusion that are just barely out of focus, you're going to see lots and lots of donuts. But if you have your focus set, and this generally is the case with closer focused subjects, if you, your focus is set so that the circles of confusion are much larger, then what's going to happen is there's much more overlap and much more blending of the boundaries of the torus of the donut out of focus circles, which means they blend together and lose that donut quality in our perception of them. You're probably going to see lots of reviews about this lens's terrible contrast if you go looking around online. And I'm going to suggest that those reviewers didn't use this lens properly. So at infinity focus, focused into the sky to photograph planes especially, but really anytime this lens is at infinity focus, it exhibits low contrast, but it's not the lens. That's because there are dust particles and ultraviolet scattering in the atmosphere. If you focus this lens close, the contrast is really incredible with no adjustment in post. And that's because mirror lenses, as a rule, have good to great contrast in color because of how mirrors reflect light as opposed to passing it through the glass like a refractive system. If you use this lens properly, you won't need to worry about contrast. And what I mean by properly is don't focus at infinity. Focus much closer than infinity. Now that said, if you would like 
here's a quick three-step process to boosting contrast in images if you feel you need it. You can build off of this process by using blending layers, by duplicating a layer, adjusting the color or the contrast, and then using blending types like soft light or luminosity in Photoshop with adjustments to opacity to further adjust your image contrast. But by and large, if you're using this lens in a way that is the way it was designed for, you're not gonna have issues with contrast. Balance with cameras is fine with heavy cameras. Also, the he heavy cameras, because of their weight, do tend to help keep this lens stable. Light drop off with this lens is significant. At times, I found this fine. It creates a very heavy vignette on full frame. Sometimes it bothered me, and sometimes I found it downright upsetting. And then a lot of the time, I didn't even notice it. The vignetting is very significant at infinity focus, but when you get to the very close focus and you're using a smaller part of the image circle, that vignetting disappears. So again, let's go back to what we were talking about with contrast. If you use this lens properly, which is to say focused close, then the vignetting and the light drop off is not gonna be an issue for your images. One note about this lens's construction is that the tripod mount on this, it has a tripod collar. That mount makes this lens very hard to remove from some cameras like the F4 and F5 because their body shape limits the tripod collar's movement. It can't rotate the full 90 degrees. And that tripod mount, when, it, when the lens is put onto the F4, F5, and similar cameras, the tripod mount on the lens blocks the lens release on the camera body. The way that I get this lens off of my F4 and F5 is I set the lens down on a table I use my car key, I put it between the tripod mount on the lens and then I and the camera body and I tilt it upward to push the lens release at the same time that I'm then rotating the camera to get it off of the lens. It's something to behold, I'm sure. Also, the actual bayonet mount on mine is staggeringly loose for a lens at all. And it has fallen off of at least one of the F adapters that I use for Sony. Uh, that said, it does not quite exhibit that same display of looseness on Nikon camera bodies. Also, I do know that the owner of this lens was a professional working photographer from the 50s until the 80s, and he used this lens a lot for local sporting events and journalism. So your experience on mount stability with this lens may well vary from mine. Firstly, I can't honestly believe I'm even touching on video use for this lens, but it's in the script, so here we go. To start off with, don't do it. The major issue with video isn't anything about this lens's image character, but the focal length. Using this lens for video provides a significant challenge for image stability. A slight breeze or an excited heartbeat will make your shot look like the Blair Witch Project. It can be stabilized well with a tripod, with a good tripod, and panned with a good panning head, and that is, that is possible, but handheld use, even with a gimbal or stabilizer, is going to be out of the question if you want stable shots. Focus breathing is a thing. It, I don't, it doesn't really even apply here because what goes on with this lens is so far beyond focus breathing. What happens is that foreground objects, at infinity focus are magnified to such an extent that they cease to exist and simply become diffuse areas of slightly lower contrast on the image. Now, as a creative note, that could be a very useful tool in terms of having some person or object in the foreground magically appear as focus changes. So this aspect of the reflex Nikkor may have some uses for video. The aperture is fixed and the circles of confusion will behave like they want to behave, the front element rotates during focus, making this a poor choice of lens to use with focusing while having gradient or CPL filters mounted to the front of the lens. Focus throw is extensive at around 240 degrees. This lens isn't designed from near to move from near to far in a quick movement. And if you do rack this lens through its entire focus range with your hands, 
you will need to stop focus and reposition at least once. The focus ring also moves in and out with the focus, but the ring itself is wide and easy to grip. Focus damping, at least on my copy, is smooth and it's very easy to move. I suspect that as long as one of these lenses was stored well, that focus damping will be smooth and the, the lens will be easy to move. The f there is no focus ring play. Mount stability is good, or should be good, with the, the exception of a very heavily worn mount on one of these lenses. And on a final note with this lens, it focuses well beyond infinity. Now the Nikon lens making staff did a really good job of precisely marking infinity focus on my copy, and I believe that would be true for all of them. That's something that is almost always absent on budget mirror lenses, the proper infinity marking that is. All mirror lenses focus beyond infinity, and it's just something to be mindful of when you're using this lens, especially for video, to note where you need to stop because it would be very easy to overshoot if you're focusing toward infinity. Clean your sensors well before use. Long lenses like this focus light into almost parallel rays as they reach the sensor. That means that any piece of dust will cast a shadow on your image. I left many of these in the images in this video to illustrate that. Focus peaking on many mirrorless cameras is basically useless with this lens. The slow aperture and the general softness compared to modern lenses make the peak area indicators unreliable. So here are some shots that focus peaking on my a7S II said were spot on. Like all mirror lenses, the reflex Nikkor needs to be stabilized unless you're shooting high ISOs. As a general rule of thumb, you can probably handhold this at about 1 500th or 1 1000th of a second and faster. I found the most success with this lens using films like Ilford Delta 3200 and high ISO digital camera settings. Also, if you can stabilize this lens with a tripod, definitely do that. Never, ever, ever for any reason use this to photograph the sun without a proper solar filter. This lens can blind you if you look through an optical viewfinder at the sun with it. If you're using mirrorless, it won't blind you, but it will melt the sensor on your mirrorless camera. So do not attempt solar photography with this lens unless you already know what you're doing in that arena. Let the lens come up to an ambient temperature before using it. Taking it from heat to cold or vice versa will cause convective air currents inside of the lens housing, and that will affect focus because the air turbulence inside the lens changes the air's refractive index, which alters the light's path in the airspace, and that will alter lens performance for the negative. Embrace the lens's image characteristic. It gives you donuts, and it has a lot of vignetting at infinity and near infinity focus, especially on the vignetting. And that's just part of how it works. You can use software to remove the light loss if you want to, but also it's good to see if you can make this lens work for you and your shooting style without doing that. If you, would, if you learn to use this lens within its limitations, it will help you flex your, your shooting style muscles and develop new techniques than whatever technique you're relying on in post to change the image to something you want it to be. One other thing, this isn't a tip you'll often hear me say, but shoot APS-C to control light loss if that's going to be a major issue for you. This will make it harder to hold the lens steady because you'll have an effective focal length of 750 millimeters, but you'll have an image that is taken only from the more evenly illuminated part of the image circle. You can also use this lens's telephoto compression coupled with the shallow depth of field to make your distant backgrounds more dominant in the scene and the foregrounds still somewhat separated. Metering modes will majorly affect image results. Center spot and center weighted will result in darker vignette than will matrix metering. When shooting digital, shoot in live view and use focus zoom. Also, always shoot raw for digital to allow for better contrast enhancement, saturation increases and sharpening, whatever tools you want to use to, uh, to edit these, these images. 
Practice focusing, or if not, then practice high speed burst mode shooting as you rack the focus slightly in and out, hoping that one of those hundreds of photos is in good focus. So really, practice focusing with this lens because you'll have to go through fewer photos when you get back to post just to find one that looks good. Practice tracking with this lens before you need to use it. Go stand by a roadside, at a harbor, or near an airport. Practice tracking vehicles as they pass. Trains are also really good for this practice because you can use the cars after the engines to practice in rapid succession tracking these, the, the train. And because the train cars and engine will all be moving at a consistent speed that can help you develop the muscle memory as you practice tracking. This practice will help you a lot when you photograph wildlife or sports with this lens. Understand lastly that this lens is a hard lens to use. You need to earn the quality photos you can get from it. That's going to require a lot of practice, patience, and accepting of this lens's image and handling characteristics. Overall, this lens is interesting. It's one that's going to be really divisive within reviewers. I, th I will tell you that if you take it for what it is, it's going to deliver well, it's going to punch a bit above its weight class, and it's going to be very light and easy to carry, com especially compared to refractive 500mm lenses. A lot of reviewers will deride this lens for being low contrast, low sharpness, hard to use, and yeah, used a certain way, all of those things are true. But this lens is like any lens, and you'll hear me say this over and over in this series. Lenses have a usable range. They have a usable set of subjects, just things they can and cannot do. If you are going to use this lens, and by mirror lenses standards, it is really a good mirror lens, especially for the price you can have them for today, just learn to, to use it as it was designed and as it can deliver images. And, and if you do that, you are not going to be disappointed by what this lens delivers. It has a lot that it can give you in terms of image quality, if you are willing to work within the limitations that it sets for you.